Welcome to my video tutorial on the Leffer curve with overlapping generations, model and computation. This video tutorial is structured in two parts. In the first part we will look at the economics, at the model, and in the second part we will look at its computation. So you may choose between either Gauss or a MATLAB version for the computer code. So in order to benefit the most from this tutorial, I would advise you to download the slides that I will present shortly and also download the computer code either MATLAB or Gauss depending on which program you prefer. And let's get into the slides right away so that I can present to you the model. So the basic idea of the Leffer curve is that with increasing taxes the tax revenue will increase as well. But once you hit high income taxes, here for example at the amount of approximately 70%, taxes start to decline again because the disincentive effects to, to work will increase so much that the tax base will decline faster than the tax rate will increase. And at, of course at a tax rate of 100% nobody has an incentive to go to work and then the revenues are down to zero. So there are many tef different Leffer curves that you may consider. So you vary the tax rate and as a consequence of course tax revenue will decrease or, dec uh, or increase and the fiscal budget has to adjust. So one way to adjust it is for example to increase government consumption. We will opt for the so-called S-Leffer curve. So in our case if we have higher government re uh, tax revenues the government will redistribute them to the household's lump sum, lump sum so our government transfers adjust to balance the budget. So this is the so-called S-Leffer curve in the original model of Trabant and Ulich in the Journal of Monetary Economics 2011. Now since we also model the demographic structure, we also have a pension system. We have workers and retirees and we have a pension system. So this is absent from Trabant and Ulich and we will have to take care of this as well. So how does the social security budget uh, adjust and we assume that the pension replacement ratio stays constant and the pensions and the social security adjust accordingly. So in our general equilibrium model what's happening is that if labor income taxes increase the household will reduce the labor supply and also income will decline. This will reduce savings. But in these models typically the labor supply declines more than savings, so this means that the capital labor ratio will go up and as a consequence the wage rate per efficiency unit will go up as well. Now if we keep the pension replacement ratio constant, this means that pensions go up and as pensions go up and also the con social security contribution changes due to to uh, lower, lower labor, aggregate labor. This means that we also have to adjust the social security contribution rate. And this will be our assumption here in our computation of the Leffer curve. So first extra revenues are redistributed lump sum and pensions are adjusted so that the pension replacement ratio is constant and consequently the social security contribution rate adjusts to balance the social security budget. Now our model follows Trabant and Ulich closely but we study the version, the overlapping generations extensions from uh, Herr Polito and Wiggins. In addition to, to the Herr Polito and Wiggins, we also look at a shorter time period of one year. Besides, our models are identical. We will find out that the Leffer curve for labor income revenues 
will peak at 71%, uh, so this will be exactly the same value that results from the Ramsey model as in the Trabant and Ulich model, and total tax revenues peak at a lower rate of 68%. Now let me explain why this peak of total tax revenues occurs at a lower tax rate. When we start in the United States and we calibrate our model to, with in accordance with Trabant and Ulich and choose a labor income tax rate of 28%. If we increase labor income taxes, labor supply will decline, aggregate labor supply, and so will aggregate income and therefore aggregate consumption. So on this, uh, on this side of the Leffer curve, if we move up, Consumption taxes will already go down, and therefore total taxes, which include consumption taxes as well, and also capital uh, income taxes, the peak occurs at a lower labor income tax rate. We also find the total taxes peak at 66%, and we can increase our total taxes by 47%, which amounts to approximately 6% of GDP in the benchmark case. So the tax rate that we find, the maximum ta revenue tax rates, are the same that results from the Ramsey model. So here I take the results from my book, Public Economics, Chapter 5, where I, I use the Ramsey model to compute the Leffer curves. But as you can see, our our labor income tax revenues, our additional labor income tax revenues, 24% vis-a-vis 67%, and total tax revenues, 47% vis-a-vis 31%, are different in the two models due to the presence of retirees. So this is the result that I replicate from chapter 5 of my book, uh, where I consider the Leffer curve for labor income taxation in the Ramsey model. And you can see the line for labor income taxes is a little steeper in the Ramsey model, so we have little different, different behavior of these two models. And of course, what's interesting is what happens to our Leffer curve in the process of demographic aging. So over the next 50 or 100 years, the population in the United States will become much older, much grayer, and as a consequence, our Leffer curves will become flatter and the potential tax revenues are smaller. And you may use my computational code to check out what happens to tax revenues in the process of demographic aging during the so-called demographic transition. So let's get into the model. We consider annual periods T, and our life as a newborn starts at age 20, which we will denote by S. We work 45 years, then we retire at, at uh, age S equal to 46, so our retirement age will be denoted by uppercase R, and we live uppercase J periods altogether, 70 periods, so this co corresponds to real life age 89. We can denote the number of, of agents at age S by NTS, and NT denotes total population, so the total population is just, NT is just the sum of the popu population in the different cohorts from S equal to 1 equal up to uppercase J equal to 70, over the 70 cohorts in our model. We assume that the number of young agents grows at the rate n, and if, as we often study stationary, as we study stationary equilibria, where the survival probabilities phi will be constant, uh, the total population will also grow at the rate n. We will choose the population growth rate n as the average of the U.S. population growth rate during the period 1919-2010. So this is the same calibration period that was used by Trabant and Ulich. The survival probabilities of our agents, as I said, are stochastic. 
and they are also chosen to be the average over this period 1990 through 2010. Let me show them to you. So they are declining monotonically over age. So at age 20, it's basically 100% to survive up to age 21. And from to survive from age 88 to age 89, the, the survival probability is approximately 89%. And at age 89, your survival probability is zero. So you die for sure at the end of age 89. Let's get back to the description of the population. And with the variable mu, as we denote the share of the S-year-old cohort in total population. So this will be constant in our stationary equilibrium with constant survival population, survival probabilities and constant population growth rate. The household maximizes expected intertemporal utility. So it discounts utility in each period by the discount factor beta. And as we look at expected intertemporal utility, we also have to consider the product over the survival probabilities from hj equal to 1 up to hs. Instantaneous utility u is a function of consumption and labor supply, c and l, and it, the functional specification is taken from Trabant and Ulich. So this utility function in equation 3 has a nice probability property that it's in accordance with long-run growth. So, for example, our labor supply does not converge to zero eventually if we have economic growth in our model. And we have a constant fresh labor supply elasticity far, or in, in the tech writing VAFI equal to 1, which uh, measures the response of the percentage response of labor supply to a percentage increase in the wage rate for exogenous wealth, for constant wealth. The household supplies labor supply LS during working life and we will set it to zero during retirement. And we also have an additive term for utility from government consumption. This additivity allows us to, to disregard the effect of government consumption on the optimal policy functions of the household. Net non-capital income is presented by wage, net wage income during the working age. So net wage income is uh, the wage rate W times efficiency of if, uh, labor and efficiency unit. And the efficiency is given by aggregate productivity, AT, by an age-dependent productivity, Ys, and labor supply, Ls. And we consider, of course, net wages, so we have to pay wage income taxes, tau L, and social security contributions, tau P. In old age, pensions are uh, provided lump sum, pension ST. In fact, this will be set constant. So we, in our demographic model, that explicitly accounts for the ages of our workers, we of course need to introduce YS, our productivity of the S year old. Let us take a look here at this profile, as, which is taken from Hansen. It is hump shaped and peaks at age 50, and 50 year old agents are almost twice as productive as 20 year old. So if you study demographic effects, for example, on the Leffer curve, it is paramount to introduce this age efficiency profile. So let's assume that the United States is growing as aging. This means that the number of older workers increases relative to the number of younger workers. And as older workers are almost twice as productive as 20-year-old workers, this means that the average productivity, the average efficiency in the U.S. workforce will go up as the United States ages. And of course, we need to consider this effect if we want to study uh, the tax revenues from, let's say, higher product, productive workers, even though they are fewer, or if you want to study, for example, issues of public pensions reforms. 
and we assume that aggregate productivity AT grows at rate GA. Of course, aggregate productivity is also a, an important factor for the study of demographic issues like public pay-as-you-go pension system. The return of a public pay as you go pension system depends on two factors, two growth rates, the population growth rate N and the, and the uh, productivity growth rate GA. Both will increase the individual return from social security contributions because if I uh, contribute today and I will receive a pension in let's say 30 or 40 years, if we have high growth rate GA then the young workers in 30 years will contribute much higher amounts to the pension system, so I will receive a higher pension. And on the other hand, if population rate, rate growth rate N goes up, this means more young people in the future will provide pensions for fewer old people, retirees. This also increases the pension payments. So these two growth rate will drive the profitability of investing, the return of investing into the public pension system, the pay-as-you-go pension system. The budget constraint of the household is provided by equation 5. So the household holds two kinds of assets, capital K and government bonds B. Since we neglect any uncertainty, these two assets will provide the same return. And the return on government bonds is denoted by uppercase RB, so this is a gross return. It will be in our calibration, it will be set to 1.04, so that government pays a real return of 4%. And this, there will be no taxes on government bond returns. And so this must be equal to the net return on capital, which is uh, the interest paid on capital, lowercase r, minus depreciation delta. We have to pay capital income taxes tau k. And with this formulation, it is evident that that uh, capital de depreciation delta times k is tax exempt. So we copy this formulation of the budget constraint from Trabant and Ulich for the US economy. We have three uh, tax rates here, three resources for our tax revenues consumption, which is taxed at rate tau c. Capital income taxes tau k and labor income taxes tau l, which is provided in equation 4 here. The first order conditions of the SE old household are provided in equations 6a through 6d. The first one is the is the first order condition with respect to consumption and on the right hand side you just see the marginal utility of consumption which is equal to the Lagrange multiplier lambda s times 1 plus the tax rate tau c. The second equation 6b is the first order condition with respect to labor supply. So on the left hand side you see the net return from working an extra hour 1 minus tau L minus tau P times ATYSWT. This provides us with extra utility from consumption uh, with by the uh, by the product specified on the left hand side, a lambda times extra extra wage income, net wage income. And this is equal to the marginal disutility from labor supply with which is our right hand side. Notice that from our equation 6b, if we take the log and, and differentiate log, uh, log L with respect to log W, keeping all the other variables constants, we find that our fresh labor supply is equal to, to, equal to phi. The two Euler equations are provided by 6c and 6d. The first one is the Euler equation with respect to capital and the second one with respect to government bonds. So of course the individual is, is indifferent whether to spend an extra unit of good today which will pro provide him with, with a marginal utility lambda st or saving this, this one unit which provides him with the 
return 1 plus 1 minus tau k times r minus delta in the case of capital. Uh, receiving utility lambda s pl plus 1 in the next period from this extra savings. And of course discounted by beta and we take the expectations so we also have to multiply it by the survival probability phi. Now th since we neglect any uncertainty of our returns, capital and government bonds must provide the same return, otherwise you would just accumulate the asset with the higher return. So in equilibrium the return on government bonds and the return on capital must be the same. Now as a, this poses no problem in the Ramsey model uh, because since we have just one representative household in the Ramsey model, he must hold government bonds and capital in the same proportion portion as in the aggregate economy. This also does not provide any problem in our in a two-period uh, overlapping generation models because there only the young households accumulate savings for the next period and of course these savings must be also equal to the aggregate savings. Now in our 70-period overlapping generation models our portfolio allocation is indeterminate. So we may have some, some households who just hold capital, other households who just hold government bonds, and they are in they're indifferent between the with regard to the portfolio allocation. So without the loss of any gen generality, as a, we assume that they all hold government bonds and capital in the same proportion as in the aggregate. So, for example, individual capital stock is sold in the proportion of aggregate capital stock relative to total assets, and total assets are simply the sum of K plus government bonds B. The production is specified as Cap Douglas, so if uh, aggregate labor is simply uh, aggregate productivity A, labor productivity, times aggregate labor, and aggregate labor LT is the sum let me jump ahead to equation 14b, the sum of the individual labor's supplies. So individual supply labor Ls times their efficiency H efficiency Ys and each cohort, each H cohort S has the number Nt of S. And we just sum up all these individual labor supplies in efficiency unit over total working life. Total capital stock uppercase K is also the aggregate capital stock which is simply the sum of all the individual capital stock over the 70 periods, over the 70 cohorts. Capital depreciates at rate delta and as I already pointed out aggregate productivity grows at rate GA. Firms maximize profits and we have the standard first order conditions that the, that the marginal products of capital and labor are equal to the interest rate, real interest rate and the real wage rate according to equations 10. So that in, in equilibrium profits are equal to zero, so we had assumed competitive markets. Governments Expenditures consist of public consumptions, transfers, and interest payments on public debt. And this is financed by taxes, by government debt, and by confiscated accidental bequest B, according to equation 11. So equation 11 is our fiscal budget constraint. Our uh, bequests arise be due to our assumption of stochastic survival. So if you die, for example, at age 50, we assume that the government collects the accidental bequest and transfers them lump sum to the household according to, uh, according to equation 11. So we do not model Bequest in our model explicitly, this would rather complicate our model to an incredible degree. We assume that government consumption 
grow at the constant rate, which will be equal to our economic growth rate, our exogenous productivity growth rate, GA, so that our stationary government expenditures, for example, are given by uppercase gate GT, our level of government consumption divided by aggregate productivity and the number of people in our economy, NT. Accidental bequests are given by equation 12, and notice that they also include interest payment on capital and bonds. This is provided, uh, the, the reason for this is provided in the appendix 6.1 in my book on public economics. You can also find out that this is the accurate description of accidental bequest by summing up the consumption of all individuals using the budget constraint 5 and substituting W, the wage rate, and the interest rate from, from the first order condition of the household and substituting transfers from the government budget 11 and pensions, as we will see shortly, from, from our social security budget. And then you can see that it will result in the goods market equilibrium so that our aggregate production is equal to consumption plus investment plus government consumption. Now total taxes are levied on consumption, interest, income and wage. So at interest rates, uh, sorry, at, at tax rates tau c, tau l and tau k respectively. In aggregate, total consumption is equal to the sum of individual consumption. I have already pointed out uh, aggregate labor inefficiency unit, where we have to consider that individuals have different productivity, y as depending on h s, and aggregate capital is simply the sum of the individual capital stocks over the 90 cohorts. We also have a social security budget, so our total spending on pensions on the right hand side is simply the pensions for the retirees which have number nt of s for those aged r equal to 46 up to age j equal to 70. So for our 25 cohorts of retirees and this must be financed by social security uh, contributions tau p which are placed on WLT, on total wage income. We will adjust tau p in our Leffert curve computation so that it balances the budget 50. And as already said, from all our equations above, using starting from the individual budget constraint, we can derive the goods market equilibrium so that total production is equal to consumption, public consumption, and investment. In order to solve this model, we need to transform individual variables into stationary variables. And by uh, dividing through aggregate productivity 80, and for aggregate stationary variables, we get aggregate stationary variables by dividing by 80 times the size of the population nt. And this provides us with stationary equilibrium conditions 17, 18, 19, and 20, 21, and 22. We calibrate the population parameters with the help of the United Nations data set 2050. All production and preference parameters are taken from Trabant and Ulich, and we use, the, in addition, the gross pension replacement ratio of 35% from the OECD. So let me go through the values of our calibration. The population growth rate is 0.95%, as in the US du during 1990 till 2010. Production elasticity of capital in the production function is set equal to alpha 35%. Capital depreciates at the rate 8.3%. The growth rate of output, which will be equal to our economic growth rate, will be 2%, as in Trabant and Ulich. Our intertemporal elasticity of substitution is rather standard, equal to one half. 
and our fresh elasticity of labor supply equal to 1 is, is more on the upper range of the empirical values considered in, in such dynamic general equilibrium analysis such as ours. The preference parameter kappa in the utility function is set equal to 3.63 as in the Trabant and Ulich model. Notice that they calibrated the values of kappa differently for different countries. So they looked at the US and European countries and they found that the US, for example, people are uh, were very busy, some working much harder, so kappa is lower, while in some Central European countries the kappa is higher, so people work less, put much F less, less weight on a higher weight on the disutility of labor, so tend to work less ceteris paribus. Our factor beta 1.037 is calibrated so that the real government bond return is equal to 4% in our benchmark case. The tax rates are taken from Trabant and Ulich as well, so taxes on labor income, which are both tau L plus the social security contribution rate tau P, are equal to 28%. This is taken from Mendoza et al. originally. The capital income tax rate is 36% and tau C amounts to 5% in the US. The government share with respect to government consumption is 80%. The debt output ratio during the period 1990 to 2000 till 2010 is much lower than today, so it's 63% and we use a gross pension replacement ratio of 35%. In our benchmark economy, the policy functions look like the one presented in slide 26. So assets uh, increase until the age of 56, 57, afterwards decline. And you can see that in the beginning assets ac accumulate at a, s at a low rate, then there's an acceleration in the accumulation and later on it becomes much flatter. Now the fast increase over this time range during age 30 till, till 50 is caused by the increase in the age efficiency, in the individual age efficiency. So as people at age 40, 45 are 40 or 50 percent more productive than people at the age of 20 or 25, they also have higher income and of course even if they save the same share of income at the same savings rate than at younger age, uh, accumulation of assets increases. Now agents also start to decrease asset savings prior to age 65 when they retire and that's because at age 50, after age 50, the labor income does start to decrease due to the lower age efficiency and therefore if they want to smooth utility intertemporally, it makes sense to start the accumulation of assets prior to age 65, prior to retirement. Our con labor supply profile is hump-shaped as the age efficiency profile. It peaks at age 30, it has kings at age 30 and age 50, just like the age efficiency profile, but it peaks prior to this, so it already peaks at age 30 rather than at age 50, and this is caused by the in, an income effect. So we have higher aggregate savings, higher assets, our wealth accumulates until age, age 58, so all this time our, our savings, our income increase, and as a consequence of this income effect, we reduce our labor supply prior to the maximum in the age efficiency profile, which of course determines our substitution effect in our labor supply decision. Our consumption behavior also displays the kinks at age 30 and 50, like the age efficiency profile, but to a much smaller extent here than the labor supply profile. Our consumption profile increases until retirement, one year prior to retirement and then it drops. Now let me explain the reason for, to you for this behavior. At age 60, 
four, we have a labor supply that is equal to zero point to approximately zero point two, and then it drops to zero in age at age sixty five when we are retired. So as a consequence, our utility would increase significantly from age sixty four to sixty five if consumption remained constant. In order to smooth utility, we reduce consumption as well. So we ob typically observe this kind of behavior in OLG models with a utility function, the same as in our model. Now we have a hump-shaped hump -shaped behavior of individual consumption, and this hump-shaped in old age is explained by our our Euler equation. So let us look at the Euler equation again. It at equation six d, for example. So what's happening in old age is that the survival probability phi decreases until in the first couple of years, beta times phi is times r b is higher than than one. So this means that lambda s must be declining and this is for for zero labor supplies only possible if consumption increases. Now as beta times phi drops below Rb so that the product beta times phi times Rb is equal to, is below one, this means y s must be increasing after this after this period and this can only happen if consumption declines. So this behavior of our individual consumption age profile during retirement here that it first increases and then decline is caused by our declining survival probabilities phi. Now the numerical problem that we will study shortly is one of solving a nonlinear equations problems in 119 variables. Our 119 variables are our 69 individual assets levels, so the sum of capital plus government bonds for our individuals age 2 through 70. The one at age when we were born, of course, is equal to zero, so that's why we only have 69 and not 70 individual asset levels. One is predetermined. We have 45 labor supplies and we have five aggregate variables. The aggregate capital stock, aggregate labor, ag uh, assets which are the sum of k plus government bonds b tau p which is our social security contribution rate and transfers now this non this 119 variables we of course need a nonlinear equation system and also 119 variables and of course consisting of 119 equations. So we have 69 Euler equations which are equations 27. We have 45 first order conditions with respect to labor and we have the five aggregate conditions 23 which are presented on slide 30 here. So we have aggregate assets are equal to the sum of the individual assets. Aggregate labor is the sum of the individual labor's inefficiency units, so multiplied times age efficiency ys. We have aggregate capital is equal to aggregate, aggregate assets minus government bonds. And we have that transfers are equal to the residual from our fiscal budget and that social security contribution rate is chosen so that it balances our our government uh, our social security budgets and I'm sorry there are two typos here so this should be summed up up to 70 and here we should have s from 46 to 70 so this is sorry for a wrong index here in this sum
And we solved this model with the modified newton repson algorithm. And of course, the basic problem here is to come up with a good initial value. That's the main problem here in our, in our computation. And that's also very interesting from the computational uh, side. So we can, how do we get initial value for these 119 variables? So if you just plug in randomly or try any particular variables, uh, you basically will not be able to succeed. So your nonlinear equation problem will return an error that he's not able to provide a guess. And we will set up a stepwise procedure here. So we start with a simple 46 period overlapping generation model with exogenous label. This is particularly easy to compute because uh, it will be very akin to the behavior of the Ramsey model or of a finite lifetime Ramsey model. So we assume that people are working 45 periods and we have just one cohort with retirees. Uh, when we study the case of exogenous labor supply, so we just compute 45 capital stocks and we will take as initial gas for aggregate labor equal to 0 0.3, just the same as for the aggregate labor supply. And we set the initial value for the aggregate capital stock equal to the one that results in a Ramsey model where we have a real, real interest rate of 4%. So this is of course very easy procedure and we just have to provide a guess for the 45, p uh, 45 capital individual capital stock. And one way to do this is if we want to have the average capital stock in our ONG model equal to the capital stock, aggregate capital stock in the Ramsey model, we just assume that people over their working life assume uh, accumulate twice the aggregate capital stock 0 0.0499 and then the average will and that the increase is linear and then of course the average will be equal to the aggregate and from then on we can start to compute this very simple model and we find this to be the H Wells profile as presented in the red line of this of this picture of this graph on slide 32 so we Households accumulate approximately at a maximum of um, wells of two and start to decumulate thereafter. Afterwards, we increase the number of retirees, cohorts of retirees, by one in each step and each time compute the new capital H profile. And simply, we simply in, in each case have to provide a new guess for the uh, capital H profile, just take the one found in the previous iteration and then we just have for the new additional retirees cohort we just assume that they accumulate half the savings of the oldest cohort in the uh, most recent iteration. And so we can go on one by one, one at one cohort by one each time. So for example go from 11 cohorts to 12 cohorts and so on up to 21 cohorts. This is pictured in this uh, in this graph as well. So it becomes flatter here. If we have 11 cohorts of retirees, if we have 21 cohorts, and of course when we have finally 25 cohorts, the line is presented by the blue broken line. This is the case with exogenous labor supply. Now we just use endogenous labor supply into, uh, which and assume that as initial guess that this labor supply is equal to 30%, just like in the exogenous case. And then we introduce, introduce uh, calibrate our model so that the discount factor is chosen to imply a real interest rate of 4%. This will result in the benchmark age wealth profile the brown line in this graph. So we have to decrease, uh, uh, sorry, increase our discount factor, decrease our discount rate. So households have a higher incentive to accumulate savings. So this H Wells profile will move upwards here. So rem remember steps two, three, 
through four in our computation, we increase the number of cohorts by, each, by one in each step, we introduce endogenous labor, and finally we calibrate beta such that Rb is equal to 4%. So this will be done in my Gauss programs that I provide on this on my homepage. And I encourage you to also go on to the second part of this tutorial. Let me also point out the literature that we use. So the main reference is Trabant and Ulich, Leffer Curve Revisited in the Journal of Monetary Economics. We built on the model by Herr Polito and Wiggins on the OLG model, but use annual periods instead, and we use data from OECD and the UN. And we also took the Ramsey results for the Ramsey model from my book on public economics. So thank you for, for uh, following through with this presentation on the first part of this tutorial. And in the second part, we will look at the computation.